Welcome everyone to this new session of our webinar series on qualitative methodology uh, co-sponsored by uh, the International Institute for Qualitative Methodology and Atlas TI. I am Ricardo Contreras with Atlas TI. Uh, I will ask my colleague Yvette Mapwat to introduce Dr. Agar, but before I do that, uh, let me say a few things about uh, this GoToWebinar uh, system. I will keep your microphones muted throughout the presentation. Uh, Dr. Agar will speak for about uh, 40 minutes. And um, while he is presenting, uh, you should feel free to write down any questions that you have using the question section in your control panel. Uh, so you can practice now, you can say hello, and, and I will be able to read uh, what, uh, what you write. At the end of his, of his presentation, I am going to go to the questions uh, pane and I will read those questions and uh, I will offer the microphone to whoever uh, wants to speak. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today and, and for supporting this very important uh, webinar series. I will now ask uh, my colleague, uh, Yvette Magwat from IIQM uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Ager. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Thank you everyone for coming out today. Dr. Michael, Michael Ager took an early emeritus appointment from Maryland in the mid-1990s to work independently at EthnoWorks, now in New Mexico since 2005. Recently, he has been involved in numerous projects, short-term, long-term, and occasionally terminal. He currently works on water governance in New Mexico, clinical team performance in a Virginia hospital, lingual cultural training in general, and he serves as a co-investigator on an ESRC project called Constructed Complexities. He is the author of The Professional Stranger, Speaking of Ethnography, Language Shock, Dupe Double Agent, and the recently published The Lively Science, Remodeling Human Social Research. He writes popular articles on water in the web-based news magazine, The New Mexico Mercury. His webpage is www.ethnoworks.com. Dr. Agar, thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Michael, I will give you the microphone and you will be able to show your computer screen in just a minute. Uh, click OK when you see a pop-up message and everyone will see your, your screen. Okay. Okay, we are... We are fine, Michael. You may let me let me um, just a second, please. Just a second, please. Okay, now you may speak. Go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry. It's a, yes. I'm clear to go. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, fine. <clears throat> Greetings, everybody uh, from the high desert of New Mexico. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk to IAQM to do a webinar for them again. I did one a while ago. Uh, truth in packaging. This one is not a canned program. Um, I took the opportunity to put together some things that I'm trying to think about and figure out and thought I could use the help. Uh, most of you, I'm sure all of you actually, know about the law of the excluded middle. It means either P or not P. It's either true or false. And it's a law that I've been breaking all my life. Um, and I'm going to break it today, particularly with reference to a, a distinction between um, the notion that we deal with universals when we do human social research or the notion that we deal with particulars. And this is an argument that goes back to Hegel versus Newton. It has a lot to do with who we are uh, as qualitative researchers, uh, mostly descended from Hegel, as opposed to the mainstream of social science, mostly descended from Newton. Uh, let's see. Now the... Oh, okay. All right, here we go. Uh, this is a book that uh, I talked about in the last webinar. It's suitable for birthdays, bar mitzvahs, confirmations, and whatnot, and for a popular audience. And I put it up here because I've been talking out of it to various audiences for the last couple of years, and it's, it's fascinating to me that um, when I talk about universals and particulars in this book, usually to an audience of anthropologists or like-minded people, 
they react very critically to even mentioning universals. And you can understand why. Um, universals, are, that's an assertion that we're all like this and frequently linked to power and leading to um, naive realism, as the social cognition folks call it, which is the belief that your mental models are transparent reflections of objective reality and everybody else has a deficient version. So the power issue that comes into play here um, makes people nervous. But at the same time, I think we need to worry about it a little more than that. This is a slide that I'm not going to go through uh, from Hervé Varenne. He's a professor at Teachers College. It's for his course. <clears throat> and I'm going to use the culture concept as the example to talk about particulars and universals. Um, here's Edward Tyler's classic definition, started it all. And Hervé is already noticing, these are his words, that there's already a confusion in here about whether we're talking about culture as a, as a universal human characteristic, something that makes us human, that characterizes us as human, or whether we're talking about culture as the particular mental models and practices of a particular group. Um, and this is the this is the tension. This is the edge. I'm going to play it during the entire talk. So you know, on the one hand, uh, 40,000 years ago or so, give or take a couple of weeks, uh, something happened in the archaeological record. Sites became uh, very different from each other. One site changed through time. Um, f funeral uh, procedures, ju jewelry decorations, musical instruments, cave paintings. All sorts of things happened that indicated that something different was going on and uh, that justified the term homo sapiens sapiens. Um, at the same time, when I took introductory anthropology in the 19th century, um, we were told that culture was a human characteristic, but also that culture was the unique property of groups, and that's what we were really about. And you can see later, you can look at this if you want and look at some of the definitions. Um, uh, you'll see Le Levi Strauss is actually biological, social, uh, but Boaz, Franz Boaz, is the one who kind of set the the tone for what American cultural anthropology was going to be. Lots of counterexamples and exceptions there, but but he's by and large the uh, the person who set the agenda for American cultural anthropology, and that agenda was differences. Um, these slides I've written are things I've written about before. I'm not going to go into them in detail here. But uh, basically, anthropological work and a lot of what qualitative researchers care about is who, who, who are these folks? What is this group about? What are their practices? What are their mental models um, as something different and distinct from what I, as a researcher and my audience, uh, think of as the normal state of affairs for human life. How do I learn and understand and represent these differences so that, whoops, excuse me, I need to go back one. So that, um, in fact, in the end, I come up with the ability to translate between worlds. And let me just, let me talk about this slide just for a second because there's some things in here that are a little bit different. Um, what at least my sense of how we work is that whatever else we do, uh, whatever kind of general formulation or other conceptual schemes we map our work onto, at the basis what we're doing is translating. Uh, we're translating meanings and context between two or more points of view, certainly between ours and the one of the group, um, the group or, or the, the individuals with whom we work but uh, also for an audience that may not be like us at all. So we're translators to show how social action from one point of view makes sense from another point of view. And we, we always have to be careful about moral relativity. We're not being morally relative. This is a practical assumption uh, to do meaning making across semiotic differences. And after the fact, um, moral evaluations may come into play, but it's based on what we learned about that particular world um, and its um, its meanings and practices. And sometimes I summarize my work as saying I make sense of human differences in terms of human similarities. And see, that's the kicker right there, the human similarities. Um, even when we go into, when I go into translation to um, uh, as a metaphor for the fundamentals of my work, um, 
I still come back and loop around into the problem of universals. That what I'm doing and the translation uh, literature and interpretation, interpretive um, interpretation, translation literature makes this point as well. There's got to be a common ground in here. There's got to be a base uh, that makes this transit back and forth between different worlds of meaning and practices possible. And that base is, in fact, a, an assumed um, theory of human universals. And it's usually kind of taken for granted and lies in the background. And it, that, that's the excluded middle that bothers me and um, that I want to try to suggest a way to fix in this talk. Now, one of the things in, in um, the lively science that I do, and I hope you all had a chance to look at the, the brief video of, um, of um, uh, Donald Brown's book. Around the beginning of the 1990s, uh, some cracks started to appear in the Boasian particularistic approach to um, anthropological qualitative research. And uh, there was a book by um, Bob Edgerton called Six Societies in the 90s, where he said, um, you know, there are some objective human criteria by which we can say that practices of the folks we study, in this case usually being a traditional society, um, are bad. They're not good. They're wrong. And uh, that caused quite a bit of controversy. And then Donald Brown's, Brown's book, Cultural Universals, came out in 1991. So the, the edges were starting to crumble here around the notion that everything that everybody did was okay, a, a kind of cultural relativism and that uh, whatever they were doing was in fact adaptive given their environment. All those assumptions started to, uh, to crash and burn. Uh, Cluckhorn's mantra I've got here, it's uh, Clyde Cluckhorn, another deity. He wrote a long time ago, um, every person is like no other person, some other persons, and all other persons. And that very simple phrase I think is a very lovely summary of what we need to put together here to get past this excluded middle of particular versus universal. But then he also forgot it because he and his wife Florence Calcone uh, started a study of, of values in different societies, uh, emphasizing the differences. Um, let me just say here <clears throat> one uh, one consequence of of this argument. I, I do work in the intercultural communication area and um, I, I'm starting to believe more and more it's kind of a Donald Brown corollary that maybe the best way to teach people intercultural communication is to teach them human universals and then show them the variations, give them a sample of the variations c that can occur. We in fact did this in a project that just ended a couple of years ago. Uh, it was a collaboration between artificial intelligence and uh, people who make serious games. <coughs> Excuse me. And the idea was to um, um, locate universals and then mix and match serious games depending on the person who was playing and the world you were trying to teach them about. So for example, anywhere you go in um, you have to know how to start a conversation, conversational openings. And um, the way those conversations are open vary wildly from place to place, language to language, group to group. So we could take a universal and then automatically include it in a game with variations on the theme. Uh, so for example, um, uh, um, a lot of American speakers of American English will be fairly abrupt or even want to get to the point quote unquote immediately. Whereas in other places there's a kind of a sequence like first you ask about the family or you talk about the weather, some kind of structured form of small talk. So we could play with that. Another thing we played with that's extremely powerful, Edward T. Hall noticed this a long, long time ago in his writings, is um, direct versus indirect communication. Uh, like the difference between saying I'm hungry and saying, um, can I get you something to eat, direct and indirect. So by, by becoming aware of those universal switches, we could actually kind of build a notion of cultural competence as a universal in terms of things that had to happen or choices you had to make, and then experiment with different variations on the mixing and matching of those choices to teach people how to uh, communicate in a different uh, 
that setting. Okay, I'm talking too much about that. It was very interesting work. Here's, um, I'll, I'll cut back on these a little bit <clears throat> to save some time. But here's here's a, three examples of um, uh, massively different sorts of things that I had to deal with as an ethnographer in some of my research. And the point I want to make is that um, they couldn't have been done without universal. So Schmey is, I worked a lot in Austria, <clears throat> in Austrian German. This is a term probably from Yiddish, uh, considered a badge of identity in Austria. Uh, and it'll be in all the books. It'll be used in the newspapers and conversations. And it'll be actually practiced as well. And I kept trying to get at what this meant. I had lots of people tell me things that it meant which didn't work in terms of enabling translation <clears throat> and finally realized that what it is is that it's an irony principle that goes like this. Um, things are never what they seem. What they are is actually much worse and there's no point in getting upset about it. You might as well make a joke if you can. Uh, one of the prototypical examples is a joke. Many, many different setups. Uh, the punchline is that the German says the situation is serious but not hopeless. And the Austrian says, no, no, the situation is hopeless but not serious. So that got to be uh, very interesting. And I needed that irony principle to make the link. That's what finally did it. And irony is, of course, a uh, human universal. Capote Art, I'll tell you that one quick. I was working to help uh, with a, a joint venture between the United States and Mexico uh, some years ago in Mexico City driving to talk to a government uh, functionary, a very important signature that we needed with a Mexican lawyer. We're speaking Spanish. I asked him to give me some context, some idea what was going to happen. And he said not to worry. Uh, we're just going to, vamos a capotear un poco. We're just going to capotear a little bit. And I said, well, what's that? It's from Cape in the bullfight. You know, how you, you work the bull. You see how it likes to charge uh, and run. You do it very gracefully and very elegantly and then you know how the bullfight ends. So the point was that to make sense out of this to an American audience, uh, I had to um, go to the notion of ways of dealing with powerful uh, and difficult others in interaction and you know how, how to manage that and how to handle that. And it was nicely summarized in, the, in that metaphor in, um, in Mexico City. Uh, I'll come back to this if on request later. I was going to talk, uh, I'm worried about the time again. I, I was going to talk a bit about Etic and Emic. I thought they were kind of dead, but I looked at the internet preparing for this talk and they're all over the place on the web. So maybe it's more lively than I thought. Um, but it was a way that anthropology tried to handle this universal versus particular issue and failed because what they did was to take something where there was a relationship and sever that relationship and make it different types of ethnography. Again, um, if any, any of the audience are interested in this issue, I'll be glad to go back and visit a discussion. There's a lurking uh, background question here that I'm not going to deal with very well. Uh, if we talk about universals as opposed to particulars in terms of human social research, are we talking necessarily about the biological basis of behavior? Um, yes and no. You'll see when we get to the end. But this deserves a whole different, a whole new uh, webinar, probably several of them. And it represents current research uh, trajectories in many different areas that are extremely interesting. I put the drug case as an example because uh, we did a study of illegal drug epidemics, and our big argument was that as far as the group <clears throat> that were most impacted, this was a function of political eco economy. This was economic history. But in terms of who within the group became severely addicted to heroin in this case, it always seemed to come up at around 15%. So on the one hand, the group level explanation is obviously social political and economic, but the individual within the group is not. So maybe there's something to do with epigenetics. That's a huge um, uh, and growing field with collaboration between social and, and biological researchers. 
but anyway, I'm not going to I'm not going to try to answer that question in this in this lecture. But we can sure talk about it if somebody would like to. So how do we get out of this excluded metal with both ends and text? I want I want to be able to to talk about to shift from this either or logic, the law of the excluded metal, and go to what some people think is more of a Buddhist logic, a both and. Um, and and I'm not alone in this. There's there's a lot of new logics in artificial intelligence. They're called non-monotonic, and there's a fuzzy set theory that uh, Lofty Zade invented several years ago, that are that are trying to do this in a more in a more formal way. But I want to be able to do this. I want to talk about culture with a capital C and culture with a small c at the same time when I do my work. So let me show you an example of how this might shake down. Now this uh, modestly titled book, <laughs> Foundations of Human Sociology, is really about fairness. Okay, and I'm going to tell you about this. So step one, step one is to think about a particular central and fundamental attribute of human social life that matters in a study you're doing and wonder about some comparative work. This book was built on the ultimatum game. <clears throat> Probably a lot of you know what this is, but just in case. Uh, it's a move on the part of um, um, some groups to take a very structured game and use it to elicit behavior in a, in a, a variety of different kinds of cultural settings and then compare them. Uh, this game tradition, it's not new, right? I mean, um, um, uh, Clifford Geertz, uh, for example, is famous for an article he wrote about the cockfight in Bali. And there's many, many more. Irving Goffman was fascinated with games. Lots and lots of people, Thomas Schelling, have been interested in games as a, a focus for understanding what matters to people when they deal with each other. So the ultimatum game goes like this. Um, I get 100 bucks, and I offer part of that to you and you accept or reject that offer. And if you accept it, we both keep what we agreed on. And if you reject it, it goes back to the experimenter and neither of us get anything. Okay? So they put together a team of, of folks to play it. And now usually they've, they've done this game a lot, always with college students, mostly in the West, but some in, in Asia and, and other parts of the world. And it was it was very very similar. Um, usually the offers were in 40 to 50 percent successful offers. Um, in this study, they looked at 15 more remote villages, and it varied a lot more: 25 to 57 percent of the offer. I offered 25 percent of it, up to 57 percent of it. Rejections varied a lot across these villages, and four there were none. Uh, some accepted less than than 30, etc. Uh, Papua New Guinea, there were high offers, but very high rejections, much more so than in any other place. Now, so, so what they're showing in this book is that they're, the ultimatum game does change with, with uh, social and cultural circumstances. Some of the things they thought might help explain it were whether there were task groups that were more, bigger than, than the kinship group, uh, and whether uh, the group had, uh, were in a situation that uh, the anthros called market integration. They had something to do with a cash market setting. Um, but the, it all got a little loose. This becomes much more speculative. The, the moral of the story, uh, for the moment anyway, is this. A, an economist, a traditional economist would say, well, that's a, this is a simple problem. You offer the person a dollar and they accept it. I mean, it's logical. That's the rational way it should work. Nobody acts like an economist, possibly first-year grad students in economics, but nobody else acts like an economist. There's a sense of fairness about the exchange that does vary with situation um, uh, and, and community, but, but no one will just take the obvious rational economic answer. Now, this is not big news to anybody but, but an economist, but it supports the idea uh, through comparative analysis across many different kinds of worlds that um, 
something like fairness is a human universal. So this, I just did this uh, recently, and so I wasn't able to get the YouTube for you guys to watch. Here it is. Um, Franz de Waal, you, de Waal, I guess, you, uh, many of you know of him, he's a primatologist. He, um, he uh, gave a TED Talk, and this is from his TED Talk. He's done fairness studies. Uh, this is now 10 years old. Uh, it's been around for a while. He says it's been done with dogs and birds as well. And here's what happens. I wish I could. Please go see the, the video because it's, it's really funny, actually. Uh, here's a couple of capuchin monkeys. This isn't how they live. Uh, this is just for the purpose of the experiment. And uh, they've never been through this before. And it's well known in this, in this experimental lab uh, and community that capuchin monkeys, they, they like uh, um, uh, cucumber slices. That's, that's a treat. But they really, really like grapes. You know, grapes are the caviar of the, of the capuchin monkey world. Um, so here's what happens. The experimenter, she's here. Could you see her shoulder? She um, she does this routine that they know they've been trained for, where she holds out her hand and the monkey picks up a little pebble that's inside the cage, puts it in her hand, and she then takes a little snack and, and gives it to the monkey. Okay, so uh, this this one here, she holds her hand, he picks up the rock, puts it in her hand, he gives the monkey a little bit of cucumber, the monkey eats it, very happy about the whole thing. She goes over here, holds out her hand, gets the rock, gives this monkey a grape. And of course this monkey's watching the whole process procedure, right? And this monkey eats the grape. Back to this monkey, holds out her hand, gets the rock, but gives him a, a piece of cucumber, not a grape. This monkey throws a fit. Like this is one pissed off monkey. How come I'm not getting a grape? He's pounding his fist on the table right here. The first thing he did was to take the piece of cucumber, reach his arm through the um, through the cage and throw it and hit the uh, hit the experimenter. So this is obviously some kind of fairness that is present in uh, at least these primates as well as in humans. Not calculated like an ultimatum game, but an immediate response that this, this is not right. Now the next thing, which I also sent, uh, asked you to look at a YouTube um, uh, theory of mind, is about development. It's about something interesting that happens with kids around age four or five. And um, um, hopefully you all watch the video. It's it's basically a, a little kid and a couple of dolls in a space and one doll puts a ball, say, in a, in a basket and then the other doll is taken out of the space, and while that doll is gone, the first doll puts the ball in, a, say, a, a box, and then the doll comes back and asks the little kid, the doll who just returned wants the ball, where does it go? And uh, before four or so, the kid will send the doll to where it knows the ball is now. And after four or so, the kid will send the doll to where the doll last saw the ball. And that's theory of mind. That means the kid is developing a representation of a different mentality, a different set of mental models, a different kind of background knowledge. Um, this is something that makes fairness possible, although you know what is fair is obviously going to vary. And it's also something that fascinated me when I first learned it because uh, it's got to do with the possibility of the sort of social research that we do. Um, the acceptance of the fact that there's a different mental model operating and that uh, it's unlike ours and then of course our business is learning what that is, uh, figuring out how to, how to learn that other mental model and then translate it. And it also links in in interesting ways again this issue of, of uh, to what extent is biology relevant to the social brain hypothesis, which if you all don't know about it, Google it sometime. It's a very interesting, um, uh, it's yet another of uh, example of the biocultural sort of approach where the excluded middle between universals of biology and um, and local realities is, is breached and, and uh, brought together into a single field. And then finally, 
Boyd Richardson, again, in a very well-known um, theory of cultural evolution, gives us a way to think about how it might have how it might have developed. Um, their theory runs roughly like this: It's um, during the Pleistocene. It was particular Pleistocene, which preceded the Holocene, which we've been in for for like 11 to 12. Uh, thousand years and supposedly are now in transition to the Anthropocene. Um, the Pleistocene was a particularly difficult time in terms of the planet having all sorts of hot and cold flashes that uh, populations had to deal with. So their speculation, their hypothesis is that mutual learning was selected for because uh, it developed as a way to rapidly adapt to these to these varying climates. And if that's the case, then you could expect increased group variation uh, in, in in this capacity. And that would lead to something that, again, is a controversial claim, but uh, group selection. Usually evolution had been thought of as, and some still insist, I believe, that it should be thought of as operating on individuals in terms of variation with reproduction and then natural selection. Um, and this argument is that, yeah, well, it also evolution operates on groups, uh, that a group who cooperated and learned would would do better than a group that was just full of individuals who were seeking their own, uh, their own, their own particular advantage. So if that occurred, then you'd, you'd also get uh, developments of, of um, group systems that supported and encouraged and reinforced this development, so pro-sociality, in other words. Uh, you get moral systems, empathy, shame, and uh, it, it's not a, much of a stretch to think of fairness as being a part of this, this pro-socially developing system. So I put all this together as I was, over the last few weeks as I was thinking about this, I used this talk to think about this problem. And I thought, well, this is this is really a pretty nice uh, kind of research design. It's probably an introductory textbook of something that I haven't read, <laughs> but uh, a way of dealing with the excluded cultural middle, a way of dealing with culture with a capital C and culture with a small c at the same time, a way of dealing with the with the universal and the particular at the same time as part of any research I do, and that would be that given a candidate for a basic universal dimension of experience like fairness, you could look at empirical distribution in a comparative way like the um, uh, the foundations of human sociality did. You could look for the plausible precursor among our closest relatives, primates. You could look at human child development to see if in fact uh, you could spot it happening, you could see it develop and, and look at how that, uh, when that happened. And you could ask about its evolutionary plausibility. And then, of course, always looking at what is the space of specific instances uh, where fairness occurs and how and why does it vary. I'll get to that in a second uh, by way of conclusion. Um, and I, I, I'll be curious what, if anything, uh, folks who have comments either during this webinar or, or uh, uh, via email later, um, you can always uh, contact me through um, through my webpage, ethnoworks.com. Uh, uh, what do you think of this? Because it struck me this is a really interesting way to begin uh, uh, this systematic and careful development of a theory of what it is to be human, which is really the theory, I think, that I care about most and that um, human social research has to uh, offer and contribute to the intellectual streams that are currently ongoing that mix um, this interest in particulars and universals, but also this interest in the relationship between nature and nurture, between biology and culture. Uh, not to mention, I'll show you in a sec, how to integrate other sorts of natural sciences into and human social research as well. All right, enough of uh, my preaching. Let's, well, and here it is. So, um, I'm checking my time. 
Oh, I'm all right. So, uh, <clears throat> what what happened? <clears throat> I have a long and checkered past in the uh, in the drug field, as some of you know. You know, I moved to New Mexico in 2005, and I had begun working outside the university. Outside of my, I left my academic job in in the mid 90s. Out of uh, out of boredom, mostly to be honest, and just wanted to do some different projects. And so an interesting one came along after I moved here. Um, the biological ecologists at the University of New Mexico have a have a site, a long-term ecological research center site, south of Albuquerque. <coughs> excuse me, called Sevilleta. And as a lot of you know, biological ecologists really don't like people very much. They they pretty much consider us an invasive species. And uh, but they wanted to incorporate uh, what they thought of, what they called behavioral social science into into their work. So they contacted me. Now it didn't work very well, and one of the reasons was uh, they had had a meeting at the National Science Foundation where they said, okay, we have biological ecology over here, and now we've got all this human, social, political, economic stuff over here. So we'll put them in a diagram and we'll draw arrows between them and look at their interrelationship. And um, the trouble with that is that you destroy the data before you start the science. But the good news is, for me anyway, I got interested in working on water. And uh, boy, what timing. I mean, conferences, books, newspaper articles, um, partly thanks to the California crisis making all the national media. Uh, it's just, there's an, there's an epidemic, an exponentially growing incidence curve of, of water panic. Um, so this is a picture of what the data are. It's not different pieces of the world, it's the world. Um, this is a, a framework developed by critical geographers in the UK where instead of the hydrologic cycle they subverted that term and, and call it start talking about the hydrosocial cycle. And this isn't any place in particular, it's just a picture of of, um, of uh, some of the different things you have to take into account. Of course what you have to take into account is not only humans and nature and not only universals in particular, but hydrology and um, geography and geology and, and sociology and, and history and, and all sorts of things become relevant. Now, I, I realized at the end of preparing this talk, as I tacked this on at the end, that this is what motivated me to look at fairness. Because Because fairness is everywhere in this research. Um, for instance, in New Mexico, massive court cases going on right now uh, around water because we've been in a drought for quite a while. Uh, fairness. So the Pueblos, the Pueblo, uh, the indigenous people, have first rights to water and um, and in a time of shortage, that becomes an object of some attention. And um, uh, one of the questions that outsiders will raise is the water allocation was based on at ma uh, maximum agricultural use. Now they have a casino and a golf course. Do they still have first rights? That's not fair. Or uh, Ordinary homeowners, Anglos and Hispanics mostly, there's a very large number of domestic wells in New Mexico. And some of the laws are, uh, we have to meter these wells, we have to get this underground water use under control. And in fact, we're going to build a utility and we want you to give up your well and sign up with, uh, with this regional government run utility. Well, you can imagine how a lot of Western people feel about that. Take away my Water? No, no, thank you. I don't. I don't trust your utility. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know what the costs are going to be. Or consider the old New Mexican communities are called acequia communities because of the irrigation ditch system that they use. Um, the state engineer comes in and says, "How much water do you use?" And the answer is Tuesday and Friday, because the local 
traditional system has to do with times you can draw on communal water, not on uh, amount. Or they say, what crops do you grow? And the answer is, it depends. Well, the state engineer wants a fixed regular amount, so he or she, he, in this case, always he, can calculate the results. All right, so I, I, I know I'm going over a lot of things really quickly here, but I just want to show you that that um, that fairness, it's not just among different groups with different traditions, but it's it's hugely central in the discourse of the current water crisis and the proposals for changes in governance. Um, what did I, let's see, what did I write here? Making sense out of history, contemporary political ecology, discourse variations, uh, problem solving, conflict resolution, and governance change. And in fact, having done this talk for you all, I started thinking, well, maybe there's a, a way of looking at other fundamental characteristics of this discourse, both in terms of at all levels of scale, as I said, from governance down to conversation, and particularly important in terms of uh, what what are the proposed solutions and changes for the problem. And there are. Uh, uh, Eleanor Ostrom is a good source here, who uh, we don't have time to give the background on her, but some of you will know her work, uh, where trust is critical, transparency is critical, sanction is critical, and the fairness discussion sets up a way to think about how to look at these things, both in terms of comparison, across different societies. Um, what is there in the primate world that, that might teach us something about precursors to this? How does it occur in uh, development of kids? How does this kind of a sense of these fundamental issues of interaction arise and develop and are shaped? And uh, then finally, are they evolutionary plausible in terms of the history of the human species? So, I see by the clock on the wall that I have two minutes left. Um, this is where I ended. Um, biology and culture, culture universal and culture particular, are always going to be part of the phenomenon of interest that we look at. But so are physics and chemistry, at least when you're looking at humans in their world. Uh, not to mention political economy, history, the traditional things we think about. And uh, I have a joke I, I tell sometimes and talk based on that old drug ad, some of you might remember, uh, where, uh, you know, there's a, a woman in the kitchen and she holds up an egg and says, this is your brain, and then cracks it into the skillet and it sizzles and she says, this is your brain on drugs, the old war on drugs. Um, and sometimes I, I like to say, this is your brain, this is your brain on distinctions. We get so caught up in the categories of uh, Foucault and Living Color in terms of which we're supposed to organize our thinking that uh, we distort the perception of the world we're trying to understand before we begin. So I want to repeal the law of the excluded metal permanently and replace it with the uh, maybe with the both and law or with the fuzzy set theory law. The point being that uh, the when you do a study you're constructing data and you construct it in terms of what the world sets before you, and what you, uh, and the way, and, and how you engage it, not in terms of prior sets of categories, and that depends, of course, on the question you're asking. At which point, you then begin to make a plausible argument for how to configure configure uh, the relevant domains you need to know about, and the the levels of those domains, and how they interact. And this is why water is so complicated, unbelievably complicated. Very interesting field to work in. The thing that makes me sad, especially on behalf of people who uh, who don't have the luxury of getting old enough to start working independently off their retirement savings, is that you may get it right, but you'll always get grief from the idea distinguishers, as I decided to name them. Um, I'm not the only one. I don't really have such a vested interest in these issues anymore, except to feel bad for folks who do have them. But, you know, so many other traditional academic categories are getting in the way of this. Uh, the structure of organizations, the nature of peer review. I, I'm now hearing more and more and more comments critical of the impossibility of getting a coherent peer review on the part of younger colleagues. Uh, uh, fund Whoops. There goes my, my timer. Um, 
and I also I got spoiled because a lot of the work I did on projects in the organizations in the real world it was uh, it was an interest in a problem, not an interest in a prior set of distinctions. And um, the decision to go to work was often based on reputation, the nature of the concept, the cost, and the evaluation of how it was working. And uh, it was just so refreshingly direct and to the point uh, compared to a lot of the things that we have to go through in academia. Um, I'll just say in conclusion to, to support this statement, one for qualitative world and one for anthro world. In the anthro world, uh, not so long ago, I, I've had younger colleagues talk about this and grad students. Um, there was a shift from going into this kind of work without carrying the heartbreak of the law of the excluded middle so heavily. But now more and more there's an emphasis on students tightly structuring a project even before it begins. And they're rebelling against that, particularly in anthro. And in the qualitative world, I remember some years ago, I started getting upset when it went from this really exciting new development to students complaining about forced choices. They had to say they were doing either ethnography or narrative or grounded theory or phenomenology and, and were not allowed to think about the problem and how any or all of those streams might form together into a, um, a really productive way to do some research. So I'll stop with that comment. and. Um, Thank you all for listening and be happy to hear whatever you have to say either now or in uh, subsequent emails. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, let's now see uh, who would like to ask you questions. In fact, I have one already uh, and I would like to give the microphone to Duncan. Uh, let me uh, hear Duncan, I will, I will give you the microphone. Perhaps you can say something here. Go ahead. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes, very clearly. Yes, yeah. oh, thank you. Okay. Um, just uh, I really like that idea of uh, idea distinguishers. Uh, that, that's a great uh, concept. Um, <laughs> you, I'm aware you're also interested in metaphors, and I'm wondering how you might relate that to your main theme, which is keeping the, the ends and the middle ground. Well, metaphor is a good place to talk about that, Duncan. In fact, um, there's a lot to say about it. I'm curious what you have to say about it as well. I mean, uh, since George Lakoff's work um, on, on metaphors as a universal foundation for languages everywhere, um, there's, there, in fact, uh, the, uh, the project I talked about in, um, with the artificial intelligentsia, intelligentsia evolved further into metaphors. So the question became, are there classes of metaphors, given the universal basis of metaphors, are there, are there certain configurations of metaphor that, that characterize different national discourses in their media? And, and what might that tell you about, um, about a fundamental orientation for the, and sort of a management of meaning within that state? And you can do that on the, you know, you can start with, um, with the embodied metaphor idea, which is where the universality comes from of up and down and movement in certain directions and um, and then and watch how those are built and used to, and extended into um, into different semantic domains to, to characterize them. I'm not giving you a very good, ex I'm not giving you an example at the moment, I'll try to think of one, um, but does, does that get at? Uh, well, it's an interesting, um, what I might take away from your comment is uh, possibly looking at the way metaphors are used in different cultures and, and um, both as sort of a universal communication mechanism and that they may say something particular about cultures, um, the, the particular cultures through the metaphor. Yeah, I mean, you, uh, if you looked at the, um, the Donald Brown video, he, he begins with a classic example that I won't did you did you take a look? This is I'm not checking here, but uh, no, no the, the I don't have time. Sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Okay, we'll take a look when we're done because he starts out by saying his epiphany. He's a guy who was trained like I was in the Boazian tradition. Differences, differences, differences. And he was sitting with a young man in Brunei where he was doing his field work, and the young man sat lower than he did, and that bothered him. Uh, 
and uh, uh, he talked about how eventually he came to understand that showing respect that what the young man was doing was in fact a universal and that relative level up and down was in fact a way to to demonstrate social rank that that was also a universal so um, that would be a, a simple example it's also very central in George Lakoff's work directionality higher is better than lower for example is something he claims is a universal metaphor right. um, and then and then Donald Brown went on to talk about his whole point in that video please do watch it anybody who's listening if you haven't seen it before um, that we may be skidded just politically we've skidded too far into the differences column and that uh, obsessing too much about the differences is, is a conflict generator and that uh, awareness of universality and common humanity is in fact uh, perhaps a bridge to more peaceful orientations to other kinds of folks on the planet. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh... Uh, uh, Michael, for your answer, let me see here. I'm going to give the microphone to uh, Sushrut. Uh, and, and my apologies if I'm not pronouncing your name the right way. I will I will try to give you the microphone now. It's open. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you hear me, Dr. Agar? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I'm a psychiatrist and anthropologist, a clinician anthropologist working with the homeless population at... Uh, University College London and around the streets in London, United oh. Kingdom. Uh, uh -huh. I enjoyed your talk and uh, I just want to pick up a couple of things to elaborate on what you said because I felt uh, at times you swung from one end to the other uh, because you showed the experiment with the monkeys but uh, a couple of decades ago I met up with Carl Pribram who had written a book at that time in the 1980s called Programs of the Brain. And oh, right. as, as, yes, yes. So as a lab scientist, his reason for stopping to work with monkeys was that one fine day when he gave the monkey a banana after the monkey solved the puzzle, the monkey didn't eat it as he did before, but kept it on his side. And when he finished solving the puzzle, he gave the banana back to the researcher. And that got him th thinking about how we conduct and it can perhaps might have problems in extrapolating uh, learning experiments from monkeys in laboratories. Uh, and trying to understand universals and ideas of fairness. And because you illustrated the monkey as an important part of it, and then you counterpose that with uh, uh, the, the absolute game theory, I just wondered whether the term universal and relative is not independent out there, but these are our constructs. And we are not independent of these two terms. So when, we, when you mentioned that we need to talk about semiotics before imposing moral values, uh, where does that value lie? Uh, in the way in which we define what is universal and what is uh, relative, because you use the word fairness, uh, which if you have to look at its cognate um, equivalents uh, in other parts of the world, in other languages, they may have a whole range of issues, including the ones you stated kind called, uh, you know, transparency or truth or honesty, but there might be other aspects such as obligations um, uh, and a whole range of issues. So. Are these transactions economic or are they also not uh, cultural and defined by local cultural norms? Which makes the issue much more fluid as you said, but that leaves me with a sense of uh, nihilism because if it is fluid, uh, then we add in another metaphor of what this fluid is about and how do we construct the fluid as humans or as anthropologists or yourself outside of the academia. Well, that was a lot of questions. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I, I was no, no, no. no, it was good. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, um, yeah, there were so many things in there. The um, and uh, plus, I'm I'm taken with your work because I I used I did street work for many years. Oh, I see. Um, with um, with <clears throat> excuse me with heroin addicts mostly. Um, all right, so the data. Let me think. Let me think about this for a second. Now, the this whole this whole talk is supposed to be premised on a starting point of traditional kinds of ethnographic or qualitative work. Right. It's supposed to begin there. So it's that the fundamental problem for folks like us is to 
um, to encounter a world, it could be, you know, it could be very similar, could be very different from the world that we know, and to to make some sense out of how it works and how it operates from a point of view that allows us to see social action is coherent in that world from the point of view of a different world and vice versa, right? So that's why I, I say ultimately it still boils down uh, in the first instance in research to a, um, a, a kind of qualitative research and translation task. Then what? All right, that's the specific part and it's always done because a translation requires a base to make the connection between very different mental models and very different practices, what is that base? Because any particular study can make a contribution to an enrichment and a challenge and a better understanding of that base of what it is to be human. After that, then, and this is where the, this is what inspired the talk, what other kinds of evidence can be organized that go just beyond that single study? And then followed the litany of um, obviously comparative work, but then also the increasing tendency to look at our close animal relatives to find out um, what sort of plausible early stage of development. Is there something there that suggests this um, as a part of the same evolutionary story that includes us as one of the primates? And then the, the next one was is there something about the way a kid acquires competence in his or her world that also shows this thing happening and developing? And then is it plausible that because of human evolution, this thing that I'm interested in in this particular group uh, played some kind of role in terms of the development of the human species? So my, my aim in the talk was to presuppose the ethnographic or qualitative research task and then to think about what's a strategy for looking at other kinds of evidence to begin to collaboratively formulate a much broader and bigger sense of, uh, of what it means to be human, the theory of what it means to be human. Now if you, so that was the, that was, that's what I'm thinking about, that's what I'm trying to figure out, my, you know, and that's why I decided I'd use this talk to try to think out loud about it. The book, that I, the, the Social Foundations, uh, the modestly titled book, in fact does what you're advocating. Uh, the reason that they paired up eco uh, behavioral economists and, and ethnographers was to try to challenge what was assumed to be uh, a universal result on a particular kind of game. And they did go into context. I didn't talk that much about it uh, because of time. but. Uh, for example, they found out that in some communities, people looked at this game and said, "I don't. Know, this makes no sense at all." Right? So, I'm not sure what those results represent. In others, people said, "Oh, this is just like a game we play." So there's a kind of a familiarity there, a template that makes it make sense. Other people looked at it and realized that they had nothing to do with cash. And that there might have been a way in that community to talk about um, exchange where you could have understood fairness in a much more positive and much more direct and um, intellectual way. So uh, I'll stop now. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. It's a lot of good issues. You, Michael, we are losing your your voice. It seems to me uh, something happened there. Um, um, but but we've we've also come to the end of this session, and I want to thank you for for, for, for uh, being with us today for the second time. And um, I would like to ask uh, my colleague uh, Yvette to say a few words at the end. Uh, Yvette, please. Hi, thank you, Ricardo, and thank you, Michael, for that excellent presentation. I just wanted to mention to everyone to check out the IIQM website, www.iiqm.ualberta.ca. We have our Qualitative Methods Conference coming up in a couple weeks, actually, at the end of April. And then we have our Thinking Qualitatively Workshop Series in June. As well, we just opened the abstract submission for the Qualitative Health Research Conference taking place this October in Toronto. Thank you, Yvette. And I would like to uh, thank uh, all of you for joining us today. Uh, your support for this uh, series is very, very important for us. Uh, the next session will be on May the 28th. 
At the same time, uh, Dr. Penny Tinkler uh, will be talking uh, about uh, 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 photographs, working with photographs. And the, the, the title of the talk is Talking About Photos. How does photo elicitation work and how can we use it productively in research? Uh, so I hope you can join us uh, on May the 28th for this presentation. So thank you again, Michael, for, for, for being with us today. Uh, thank you, Yvette, and thank you, everyone else. See you next time. My, my, my thanks yeah. as well. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.